It's my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this edition of the Homestead Colloquium. The Homestead Colloquium series is organized by two uh, centers, the Ceres Center and the Kaiser Center at Homestead University. And the topic, the theme of the series is cyber physical systems and embedded systems. It's also a special pleasure today to introduce the speaker, Professor Corky Cartwright. Corky Cartwright is a professor of computer science at Rice University in Houston, Texas. And we have the pleasure of hosting him for his sabbatical this year at Homestead, which just, just started this month uh, in January. Uh, Professor Cartwright has over 30 years of experience teaching computer science. Uh, most of that has been at Rice University. Um, the work that he's done uh, covers many topics and some of these topics will be covered today in the talk. Um, he did his bachelor's degree at Harvard College in mathematics. After that he did his PhD at Stanford University working to some extent with uh, uh, John McCarthy. You might recognize the name from Scheme and Lisp and AI uh, contexts. He has made significant contributions in many areas, including one of my favorites is exact real arithmetic, which he introduced uh, fairly early on in joint work with uh, Hans Boehm. Uh, more recently, his work on Dr. Scala and Dr. Java, in particular, environments for teaching these languages, uh, has been very well received. Um, soft typing is something that made uh, important waves, significant waves in the research community in the context of the question of to type or not to type and has been a very important technology that has been used uh, by some compilers and some people interested in program analysis for example. Uh, more recently he has been interested in modeling and simulation of hybrid systems which is very relevant to embedded and real-time systems of course and I've had the pleasure of working with him on this topic for several years now and many other subjects that I can't possibly cover in this introduction. So without further ado, please welcome Professor uh, Cartwright. Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank uh, Waleed and all my hosts at IDE for inviting me uh, to come to Homestead for my sabbatical uh, and to give this talk. And so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, types and particularly the interaction uh, between types and program testing. Uh, today, and I, as someone who's been a researcher primarily in the area of programming languages, uh, I, I would guess that some very significant fraction of the papers that have been written in programming languages uh, over the last 35 years have uh, involved the issue of, uh, of types. It's a very interesting and actually somewhat controversial subject, as you will see as we go along in the talk. Uh, so, um, the question I'm going to try and address, or at least shed a little light on, is what role should uh, types play in software development? And I'm going to uh, utilize a historical perspective in presenting uh, this material. Uh, I, there are several reasons why I'm taking the historical approach. One is, uh, now that I'm getting older, I find history very interesting. Uh, there, there are lots of fascinating stories and uh, uh, vignettes that you, you see come up when you look at a, the history of programming languages and types in programming languages. Secondly, as what I would char now characterize as a senior researcher in the field, an awful lot of what I know is probably now history as opposed to the latest thing. Um, and I also believe that studying history helps us understand how the field is evolving and may, may give us a little insight on how to extrapolate what may happen in the future, which I will do toward the end of the talk. Uh, so what I, in terms of a detailed plan, I'm going to try and follow the evolutions of the notions of type, both among computer scientists and to uh, some extent, a lesser extent, because I'm a computer scientist rather than a mathematician, but what mathematicians have done uh, on the same subject. Uh, mathematicians interested in the logical foundations of mathematics. So uh, before I begin, I'm going to at least introduce the idea of uh, what types are. Uh, it's a controversial issue. You'll get in, if you ask a programming language researchers, you can very quickly get in an argument about what the def proper definition of a type should be. Uh, and uh, as I go along in the talk, I think you'll see uh, my own views on the subject uh, developed but you need a lot of actual examples to show that. Um, and I, I should mention also that uh, there, I actually accept several different meanings for the term, and it all depends on context. So you have to, if you're getting into an argument with someone about types of programming languages, it's important to listen carefully and see if maybe they're using type in a different way uh, than what you initially thought. Uh, 
The, the basic intuition for types is that it's a coherent set of values. It's a reasonable universe for some logic or whatever. It, it, it is a domain that, um, that makes sense uh, on its own. Uh, and it's important to recognize that when people talk about types, sometimes they're talking about what we call static types. These are types that are identified by the compiler at runtime. And then in other cases, they'll be talking about uh, types that are, that are recognized by the implementation at runtime. And we call those dynamic types. OK, so if we look at the beginning of the origins of type in programming languages, uh, we could actually start with the first mainstream programming language, the first one that was actually commercially successful and really widely used, and that was Fortran, uh, developed under the leadership of John Backus at IBM San Jose between 54 and 57. I actually did a little research for this talk. And, uh, so 54 was when the first design document was produced. They, f they came up with a user's manual in 56, but there was no actual delivered compiler. And finally, they delivered the compiler, I think, in spring of uh, 57, and it originally ran on the IBM 704. Um, for the, I look at this audience and I don't see that many gray hairs. I never programmed a 704. That predates me, right? I didn't start programming until about 1967, so uh, Fortran predated me by, by 10 years. Um, but at any rate, in this, so Bacchus's goal was, he claim, Bacchus claims he was lazy, right? And he just didn't like the laborious work involved in writing code in assembly language. So uh, he wanted to have a higher level equational, if you use Fortran as equational, right? we wouldn't call it that. Nobody, he wanted to use the equation, he wanted to use notation that was familiar to mathematicians, that would, that would look uh, more reasonable to them than uh, lots of uh, op codes for an assembly language. And he was very concerned that the efficiency of the Fortran compiler was as close as he could make it to what you would get with assembly language because, remember, machines were slow in those days. And you didn't want to take a significant penalty for using a, a high-level language because you'd end up, end up with a program that wasn't uh, practical. It would, be, it would be so slow. So what they did is they said, okay, we want to build in all the data representation formats that, that exist in the hardware into the programming language. And so variables, the, the, the types are really just data representations, integer, floating point, and uh, you, you either declared the variables, although I'm thinking back to my, you know, the, a long time ago, when I was actually writing Fortran code, and there were implicit conventions, depending on the first letter you used in the variable name as to whether it was integer or, or floating point. How's that for uh, sort of sneaky, uh, covert way to write code? Uh, but uh, at any rate, so you, you would have types of the variables, and then there were rules that it used to infer types for expressions. And the goal of the, the, the uh, compiler looking at these types, besides knowing what instructions to emit, was to try and, and detect when you were using types inconsistently and reject those programs. Because you didn't want uh, to misinterpret data. You didn't want to take an integer at the machine level and say, oh, and pretend it was floating point. You know, who knows what garbage you get out, right? Uh, so the other thing that was going on is that the types of the operands determined the meaning of some of the primitive operations, in particular plus. Right? So if you use plus with floating points, you'd use a floating point add. If you used it with integers, you'd use an integer add. And uh, in modern terminology, we'd say, oh, well, they were overloading some of their operations right? using the same notation plus for, for two semantically different things, floating point add and integer add. But the goal of the type system, as I said, was to reject programs that uh, misinterpret data representations. And as someone who actually programmed a fair amount of Fortran, it, it didn't completely succeed. Um, there were things like no array bounds checks, right? So if you, you generated an, outside of a, a, an access outside your array, you got whatever was in that, that mach machine word. Um, and why didn't they do uh, array bounds checks? It would slow down your computation too much, right? Uh, there were some debugging compilers that came along that would do them, but that was sort of an optional, an optional thing. Um, and then, uh, that's a, I actually I should ask for a, a show of hands. How many people here have written Fortran programs? It's not a horrible thing. What about Java? Do we have more Java people? It's kind of a little bit more Java. Okay. So at any rate, common blocks in Fortran. I haven't written Fortran, any Fortran code since the 90s, and that was an experiment. I haven't taught any Fortran since the late 70s. Okay? And most of my experience writing Fortran code occurred uh, before 1971. Okay? So, um, so I have a very archaic view uh, of Fortran, but you had these common blocks. And my recollection is you could list the variables that appeared in this contiguous block of storage whatever you wanted in each compilation unit, and it didn't really care, right? So you could have complete sort of it's like jungle rules in terms of how common blocks are interpreted, if that's a funny detail. Uh, so continuing on in terms of these um, early origins of types and programming, uh, if you looked at what the role types played in Fortran, there really wasn't much controversial there. They were just data representations, 
And there's no real distinction between static typing and dynamic typing, right? Because data representation is something the compiler knows about. The data representation is used at runtime. Uh, and, I, and it was reasonably successful, but the type checking, certainly across compilation units, was problematic. And then the fact that array bounds weren't checked, uh, all sorts of bad things could happen in actual execution. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is even at this early stage, the very first use of, of types in a mainstream language, that the types that are used for primitive operations are really white lies. And what do I mean by that? Well, consider the type of division on integers which truncates, in fact, it's, it truncates towards zero, as I recall, in, in, in Fortran, so you have, have a negative value. Um, and the type that's assigned to this is int cross int arrow int. What happens if you divide by zero? Right? You get, you get a divide check. You would get an exception thrown, and your program would, would stop executing a report that you'd done something illegal, yet this is not considered a type error, right? Because you applied an operation uh, to two ints, and we're supposed to get an int back according to the signature, according to the, the, the rule that the compiler was using for that operation. And this is true in general of typing, is that we'll make sort of a convenient approximations to the actual type behavior so it fits in the framework we're using, right? If you, you tried to have a type system that knew about division by zero, it would be enormously more complex. And in fact, it's, we, we still generally don't do that even in, in, in modern type systems. We have these white lies embedded in the, the typing rules, okay? And, uh, but the key idea I want you to take away from Fortran is that types are really designed, derived from machine representations, different formats inside the machine, and that motivated uh, their uh, use in the, in the programming language itself. And I claim this notion of type lives on in lower level languages like C today, right? I mean, you think about, whenever I think of, I don't write C code much anymore, but when I think about it, I'm just laying out bits in the machine. That's what my types are describing, describing data representations. Okay, and so for a little color, I actually did a little research and pulled up some pictures. And uh, I, I found these pictures most impressive. They were for these, the Sage computer system developed by IBM, but they actually leveraged a project at MIT called Whirlwind. And um, if you look at, say, the era 1954 to 1958, this was the highest performance machine that was available. Um, and let's see, it was the biggest computer ever built. It took up 2,000 square meters of floor space for the computer. It weighed two, 275 tons. Uh, for one, for, they built 28 of these. Uh, they were physically largest computers ever built, according to uh, the article I saw on Wikipedia. And uh, they, this was state of the art for the era in terms of speed. It would execute about 75,000 operations per second. Now, it turns out that, so it, it, you see this 1954 to 58, the machine was delivered in 54, but they had to develop the software. And they, the software system, this, the, the Sage you know, radar for detecting whether the Russians were going to invade us, uh, was over 200,000 lines of code. It was by far the most complex piece of software that had been built, uh, designed at the time. However, uh, I, I, I like these pictures. It turns out Fortran didn't run on this machine. It didn't have floating point, right? It did arithmetic in a very strange way in 16-bit uh, format. It had 32-bit words and two, uh, two numbers per word. Um, but at any rate, the, the Fortran was developed for a slower machine that IBM came out with later that used very similar technology called the 704. It was much slower, but it had floating point, okay? And uh, so Fortran was initially developed on the 704, and the 709 added more index registers, a few more features over the seven, um, 704. And then they came out with transistorized versions of the same machines. This machine had vacuum tubes. That's the reason it was so huge, right? Just think about the air conditioning required for this machine. It had I, I, uh, on the order of 50 or 60,000 tubes in it, I think. Um, and the irony is this thing gets deployed in 58, in 1960, transistors are starting to be used in computers, and they realized, ooh, we should have built the computers with transistors instead of vacuum tubes. But they continued, they had a huge investment system, they continued to use it, and I think the last one was retired about 1983. And the irony is that at that point, the only place the Defense Department could get the tubes for replacement was to get them from Soviet bloc countries. Oh, one other little interesting detail, which was mentioned in the article in Wikipedia. This machine was different from most machines of the era in that it was a real-time computer. It had a, had, a, had a video display that was driven by the, the computer itself. And this console had a built-in cigarette liar at an ashtray. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the mathematical side. So um, the earliest reference to types that I know of in the mathematical literature and, I, and there may be some people here who are true mathematicians and correct, you know, talk to me afterwards and say, oh, you can update your talk as so-and-so. But were Russell and Whitehead, and they did 
there was all this work on the foundations of mathematics that was done. You know, people are familiar with Cantor and uh, you know, Cantor's naive set theory and uh, the fact that it was inconsistent because, you know, and Russell, the Russell's paradox, you know, the set of all sets are not members of themselves. In fact, you get a contradiction there. Um, so Russell says, oh, we've got to do things in a much more systematic, rigorous way. And he, he used the notion of types in structuring his approach to the foundations of mathematics. Uh, and so they wrote this three-volume series. I think it start, the first volume came out about 1910. And uh, Russell was Whitehead's student. And so this picture, which I pulled off Wikipedia, is hilarious because it shows Russell on the left is this grizzled old man. And Whitehead is a, is a comparatively youthful guy. But the pictures were taken probably 50 years apart, right? So Whitehead is actually quite, quite a bit older uh, than Russell. Um, but at any rate, so it, it, it's famous that in their book, Principia Mathematica, they have a proof that 1 plus 1 equals 2. And it takes 360 pages. Okay? And I think there's, and, and does, do, do, do mathematicians today think of formalizing their uh, mathematical proofs in this framework? And the answer is no. I mean, some of you may know about zermelo frankel set theory, which is, the, the, the perf I guess, the most popular form. But there are a lot of different frameworks. All of them are much simpler than uh, Russell and Whitehead. Uh, I don't know any of them that explicitly use types except Russell and Whitehead. And so the question is, is there a lesson for computer scientists here in terms of uh, the perils of building excessively elaborate type systems? I don't know. Uh, but now then to talk about the aspect of uh, mathematical research involving types that really has had an impact on uh, modern uh, programming languages, and that's the simply typed lambda calculus, uh, introduced by uh, Alonzo Church, Church originally proposed uh, a more comprehensive system. He had some very smart students named Cleaney and Rosser. I don't know if you've Stephen Cole Cleaney, Barclay Rosser. Uh, and together, they showed that Church's original system was inconsistent. So Church kind of pulled back, and he, he restricted his framework, his, his, his calculus, to just the piece that describes computation. And that's what we know today as um, the untyped lambda calculus, and then in 1940, because he, he basically did research in, connected with uh, that lambda calculus for his entire career, he formulated a version of lambda calculus uh, that was typed, and it's still the core of modern statically typed functional languages. Um, and just as an aside, you know, people like to look at genealogies. So my advisor was David Luckham. David Luckham's advisor was Hartley Rogers. Hartley Rogers' advisor was Alonzo Church. Okay, so let's take a brief look at the untyped lambda calculus. Uh, you know, there, there are massive volumes written on the lambda calculus. Uh, there's a tome by, I guess it's a Dutch mathematician named Berendrecht. That's uh, sort of the canonical thing to use. Um, and it's a deep subject of which I only know a, a small mouth. Um, but it's, it, you can think of it as a pedagogic language for expressing computation involving functions. And in fact, when Church looked at this, he basically wanted to model only the parts of computations that involve functions as data, and so the only things you can write down in the untyped lambda calculus are computations involving functions. So functions are input, functions are output, and so on. Um, and the way Church defined this language was he had simple reduction rules that you would apply to lambda expressions to, to, to reduce them to answers, and to show you an analogy, without introducing all the syntax and so on for the, the lambda calculus, analogy in ordinary arithmetic is if I wrote down an expression like 4 plus 3 times 1 plus 2, you learn in grammar school how to evaluate that, right? So you go left to right, you say, oh, I've got to evaluate 4 plus 3 first, that reduces to 7, so now I'm left with 7 times 1 plus 2. Well, now I can't do the multiplication until I add 1 plus 2 to get 3, then I do the multiplication and I get 21 out as the answer. And so this leftmost notion of doing this, the leftmost reduction that matches the rules, syntactic rules, is exactly the framework that's used in uh, the lambda calculus. And in fact, it's used in many modern uh, language semantics. Okay. So at any rate, uh, so you take uh, the core uh, untyped lambda calculus that Church developed. You say, well, golly, how do I just compute with functions? That's kind of goofy. I need to add a few scalars in, a few, a few ordinary constants, like integers or booleans. And so typically, when people actually want to try and use the, the, this untyped lambda calculus as a real programming language, at least for things they write down in the book, I mean, or, or as, the, as the core for designing an actual language they're going to implement, they'll immediately throw in a collection of constants, denoting first the primitive data values, so you have all the integer constants there, and then simple operations on those constants. Okay. Um, 
And then you also need to have tables that describe, in fact, for example, plus, the table for plus is infinite. The table's describing the reductions that you do on primitive data on these constants. Okay, uh, and then if you really want to make your, your, your calculus reasonable as the basis for something you might implement, you also need to include errors. So like when you do division by zero, you'll get an error value out. Um, so that, so let me talk a little bit about um, the simply typed lambda calculus, which is built on top of the untyped lambda calculus. So basically what Church did is he just formulated a, a framework of types for annotating lambda calculus terms. And the set of types is incredibly simple. Now remember, the, un, the untyped lambda calculus doesn't deal with anything but functions. But if you're going to start describing types for functions, you've got to start somewhere. So Church just says, okay, let's just pretend there's a type D. Right? It's a type of individuals, and of course, if you do add the applied part that I talked about, then you'll end up with types like integer and real and so on. So D is just a putative base type. And then you inductively build up all the types that you possibly can using arrow. So just think about all possible trees where the only, only node in the tree is an arrow, and the only leaves in the tree are D. Okay? So that's the notion of, the, of, of types that are available. And you can sort of think of D as a base type to be named later, and of course, once you have it applied version of the calculus, you'll have base types for, for the various domains you add. Um, and so uh, well, there's a critical observation, though, about types in the simply typed lambda calculus. And that is all types are disjoint. Okay, there are no overlapping types and no subtypes. So the picture you get is this partition of the data domain into pieces where each of these is a different type. Okay, now as, as a programmer, when I'm thinking about solving problems, I actually like to think about unions. You know, set unions are, 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 are a pretty standard thing you want to do. And if you look at the diagrams that I'd like to be able to draw concerning types, they look like a, this is a very general Den diagram for five different sets looking at all the different possible intersections of them. And I'd like to talk about things like the union of A and B, or I might like to talk about the whole thing, is maybe call it a type under the name any, or if you're Java object, right? OK, so now let's talk about type safety. So recall the goal of the early type systems was to prevent the misinterpretation of data. Okay, In the literature, this is typically called type safety. If your language is type safe, you don't misinterpret data. Okay, So what happens when data is misinterpreted? I mentioned like you know, overstepping the bounds of an array. And it varies. You know, it's sort of like now you're dealing with garbage. So all sorts of things can happen. But on a Windows machine, a blue screen of death, at least back in the days of uh, Windows 98 or whatever, was very common when, when you would make a type error. Uh, but now, I've talked about the early languages like Fortran, which were, had a huge following, still have a significant following. There were another family, there's another family of languages that was more the uh, subject of academic interest res and research labs that were interpreted. Okay? Uh, and uh, the, they were, these languages were very interactive, typically. And, they were, and the early ones were all untyped. And so two examples that come to mind are Lisp and APL. Okay. Um, and so how did they manage to, to but they, yet, so they're untyped, yet they're type safe. They don't misinterpret data. So if you've got all these different kinds of data floating around, how do you avoid misinterpretation? Well, the answer is pretty simple. It's brute force. You add a tag to every data value that tells you what the type is. Right? Then all your primitive operations, all they have to do, they're passed in arguments, they have to look at the tag and see if the tag is appropriate for that operation. And throw an exception if it's not. Okay? So you can sort of think of these interpreted languages achieving type safety through brute force. Okay? They're just checking everywhere at runtime. So in these untyped languages, you have a notion of type, but it's dynamic. It's, it, it's, it's the notion of, of these sets that are indicated by tags that exist at runtime. Um, now, you can achieve type safety through static type checking as well. In fact, you sort of think, well, you know, type checking, that's going to get you closer to type safety. Rigorous static type checking, as we'll see in a little bit, actually shows that certain errors can occur. Okay? But there are other things you have to do in addition. You've got to have automatic storage management. So until we had garbage collected languages, type safety was not really achievable. Um, and you, you say, well, what about those early interpreted languages? Well, they were garbage collected. Well, they had some no, notion of automatic storage management. And that's a whole different issue. Do you call all forms of automatic storage management garbage collection, or do you reserve it for techniques that do tracing? And um, I, I sometimes use it one way and sometimes use it the other. I don't think that's settled in terms of terminology. 
Uh, but at any rate, prior to uh, the advent of modern uh, mainstream object-oriented languages, most of the languages that were really type safe out there were ironically untyped in terms of static typing. Okay, so let's, let's look at this issue of static typing. So I, I finished graduate school in 1976, and the languages I liked, that I thought were cool, that I wanted to write code in, were all untyped. They were not statically typed. And the problem was that the type checking rules used in the type languages were so restrictive, I couldn't write the code I wanted to write. If you took a program, that, so you, the expressive languages of the day were various Lisp dialects, small talk. It was a language called Sassel. It was a pedagogic functional language. And uh, I was particularly fond of Lisp. After all, John McCarthy was one of my advisors. He invented Lisp. But it turned out Lisp was flawed. It, it, was, it had the syntax of an uh, extension of the untyped lambda calculus, but it had the wrong semantics. The semantics didn't agree with the rules that Church had devised. Okay? And in fact, co computer scientists didn't really figure this out until the early 70s. They were kind of confused as to whether their semantics really corresponded to lambda calculus or not. Um, and uh, so at any rate, the, the semantics was wrong, and it wasn't fixed until the time frame of 1975 and 78 when Sussman and Steele at uh, MIT uh, rev came up with a revised dialect of Lisp that used the correct scoping rules and called it scheme. Okay? Now that fed back into Lisp, and if you look at modern common Lisps, you can get the same, it's an option, you can, but you can get uh, the same correct uh, scoping rules as, as scheme has. Okay, so at any rate, Sussman and Steele demonstrate this language is based on the untyped lambda calculus. They showed, you know, do the untyped lambda calculus with the right extensions, which is scheme, uh, you have a language that's incredibly uh, expressive and powerful. Okay, now as an aside, I notice a lot of people here are programmed in Java. Have some, presumably some of you have written anonymous interclasses. Anonymous interclasses involve exactly the same issues in terms of scoping that were done incorrectly in Lisp. And... Uh, I will say that Java gets it right, although it restricts it to final variables in terms of what you can close over. But um, they're, they're, uh, well, that's a nice offline off talk uh, or, or, or discussion to have. And I think the decision they made is, is, is very defensible. Um, but at any rate, so you look at when I got out of college, I was, I mean, out of graduate school, I was very opposed to the whole idea of static typing. It's kind of like, you know, types are made to serve man, not men made to serve types. But static typing really took it as a view that you were serving the type system. Um, so, uh, at any rate, this, this sort of perspective on writing programs in um, an extension of uh, the untyped lambda calculus, uh, namely scheme, still lives on today, right? And so there's actually my former colleague, Matthias Felleisen, has a research group developing something called Racket. That's scheme renamed. It's kind of like they figured they were in a rut because people had negative associations with scheme. And they want, furthermore, there was a problem with, with what they wanted to do versus what the scheme standards people wanted to do. So they needed another name for trying to push things forward, being a little more aggressive uh, and uh, forward thinking, I think, than the standards group. So they call it racket. But at any rate, there's a, an approach to program design that uh, Matthias, with a little bit of help from me, developed uh, in the, the 90s that's embodied in a book that you can look at online. Okay, how to design programs. You can actually get there at http.org. Okay, now I recommend the one that I have here that's actually in Mat Matthias' homepage. It's a second edition of the same book. It's not complete, but it's, it's a lot cleaner. I, I, I prefer it. But in that uh, pedagogy, we tell students to follow a particular recipe in designing programs. Okay. And I like this recipe because, in fact, even though we teach programming in the small, it, with a little bit of uh, enhancement scales well, it also adapts really well to OO design. Okay, so what goes on in this, this, this recipe? Well, the first thing you have to do is understand the problem, and in particular, understand the data that's manipulated by the problem. Then you define those data domains. Well, now in Scheme, you end up writing these de data definitions in comments, right? Because you're going to, you just declare the constructors that you're going to use. They're just, you think of constructors as basically equivalent to Java classes without inheritance or uh, roughly equivalent to structs in, in C. You have to define some auxiliary operations that uh, when you define a structure and scheme are automatically generated. So anyway, you lay out the, what, what data is going to be manipulated. Then you figure out what functions involved. And typically, when it's a simple scheme exercise, they tell you, write the function to do x. Okay. So you write down a precise contract for that top level function and any, and any other things that are at the top level that it, it interacts with, because you may need auxiliary functions to solve the problem. And 
Uh, so we actually, the, the terminology in the book's a little confusing. It talks about the type declaration as the contract, and then what you would call a contract and design by contract is the purpose. But the key thing is you've got to get the types down. That's kind of a very coarse description of what the function does. And then you actually need to write uh, what the input-output behavior for each function is. And, uh, and then for each top-level function, you need to give examples of how it behaves, test cases. So, no, we haven't written any code yet, and we're writing test cases. Okay? The other thing is it's very often useful when you define the various forms of data to give some sample data values, because then they're very useful to use in your test cases. Okay? Uh, and then you, for each function that you have to write, based on the kind of data that it processes, there's a corresponding template. And you sort of say, oh, so it's, it, it, now sometimes you have to use a fancier template, but there's a default template to use, which uses structural induction, uh, structural recursion, which is computational equivalent of structural induction. And so you write down the template, and then you just fill in slots in the template. Uh, then that's this point where you write the code, and then finally you test the code on the test that you wrote before you uh, actually act, write, wrote the code. And so this, this is very test-driven, this design process. And in this particular description, the tests are written before the code. And I would say, in real practice, that's the ideal situation. I don't object, though, people write the test while they're writing the code simultaneously. OK. So at any rate, um, so there's a group of us who really like uh, dynamically typed languages that continued on with Scheme. But there was a momentous development in the late 70s that split the functional programming community. And in particular, uh, Robin Milner, uh, a truly uh, ma you know, magnificent computer scientist, one of the, one of the real greats of, of, of the field. He made a momentous discovery regarding typed lambda calculus. He saw how you could extend the simply typed lambda calculus to, so you could type the, the programs that people would typically exhibit as, as, as sample functional programs. Okay? Not all of them, but most of them. And the key thing that he supported was something called parametric polymorphism. And the example I want to give of this is, say you wanted to find an append operation. So it's going to append two lists together. And you want it to work for arbitrary lists. You know, if you think about appending lists, it doesn't really matter whether it's a list of integer or a list of Boolean or a, a, you know, a list of strings or whatever. They append operations defined in the same way. And in fact, I've written some, some simple code here. And by the way, in, in these uh, applied lambda calculus languages, you typically add uh, a notion of let that's recursive, and then you, you, you add rules for it. It's, but it's not, it's not a big deal. It's very well understood. So I've used that extension, so I'm letting a pen take in two lists. And I'd like for the, the two lists, x and y, to be lists of alpha, where alpha is some unspecified type. And it's going to produce an answer that's a list of alpha. And then the definition just does a case split on whether x is empty or not, and recurs if it's not. Okay. So the problem is, if you're working in the simply type lambda calculus, you don't have any type variables. And so you have to write this thing, each time, a, diff a different function, for each different instantiation of alpha. So you have a separate append operation for, for, for uh, integer lists, for, for uh, Boolean lists, et cetera. Whatever list you have, you need a separate version of the function. Milner was able to support this extension with his uh, revised type system. So he's basically adding this notion of, of schematic types uh, to the type lambda calculus. And the thing that's really nice about what he did, though, is that you had people that are programming in dynamically typed languages. They don't want to have to write types down. They consider that an imposition. Milner showed that you could infer all the types. So you just write things down without bothering to write the types down, and Milner would, Milner's system would, would infer them. Um, so there are a lot of programmers that said, oh, I, can, I have my cake and eat it too. I can be in this language statically typed. I just write things the same way I would write them in Scheme. Um, Milner's work also ha had some other components to it. It's a truly remarkable paper that he, that, that he published on um, the ML language, which was part of the LCF system. He defined a semantics for the language, and he proved that type checking actually established that computations could not go wrong in the sense that they wouldn't generate certain kinds of errors. So he, in his semantics, he basically defined anything that corresponded to a type error as yielding wrong. And then he proved for any program that you could, that you infer to correct, that you could infer a type for, that in fact, and, and none of the types included wrong, that the answer that if it terminated would, would be something other than wrong. So what he did is he established, in a very formal way, an intuition that some of us had, that, oh, yeah, if you get things right, well-typed programs won't go wrong. And he actually proved it as a, as, as a, as a mathematical theorem. And um, 
I mean, this is, so nowadays when people develop a type system for a new language, they say, okay, where's your type soundness proof? Do what Milner did for, for his language on your language. Um, and it's just taken for granted that any really good design will do that. Uh, but the problem that I see is that this result's often oversold by people who really like this approach, and they'll say, oh, if I get my types right, my program's correct. And the answer is no, not true. And in fact, you can get runtime errors. Remember I talked about types being white lies? Right? So things like trying to take the first element of a list or dividing by zero, they're still runtime errors. So you say, how do you reconcile that with his theorem? They weren't included, they weren't flagged as yielding wrong in his semantics. You rig the semantics so that you know, if, you're, if you're violating one of these, these issues in a, that's a white lie, you don't get wrong, you just get divergence or, or, or something else. Okay. So uh, at any rate, the, the, the key thing to take away from this is, yeah, you have type-safe statically typed languages, like the one that Milner designed, which was an early version of ML, but they still rely on many runtime checks to achieve type safety. Your dynamically typed languages are completely like relying on runtime checks. So what you're doing here is you're factoring out the need for doing some of the runtime checks. Okay, so now let's look at the state of the art in ML programming. Well, in fact, the, the recipe that I described before could be used essentially in the same way uh, for ML, but there's a problem that comes up if you're actually tackling a problem that's subtle, and that is when you define the data domains, you've got to set them up so all types are disjoint. Okay, now people who are accustomed to doing this, they don't think it's a big deal because what do you do when you need a union? You say, oh, I can't take type A and type B and talk about the union, but what I can do is I can form a discriminated union. So you have to add tags explicitly to A, one kind of tag to A, one kind of tag to B, and you have a new domain of values which are tagged A and B. Okay? But that means for every value in A, there's an analog in the discriminated union. And you end up, if you have a type that appears in a lot of discriminated unions, you might have five or six versions of exactly the same thing. But they're not the same data object. You try, you, they aren't even the same type. You can't even compare them because you can only compare things of, of the same type. Uh, so, so at any rate, but the testing burden is arguably lighter. So you've got, there's a, there's a trade off here. You have to be more careful and, and, and follow more rules in building your data definitions. But then, some of the testing burden has been taken over by static type checking, right? Because if you've done things in a dynamically typed system, all these things that are being proved as theorems by the type checker now have to be confirmed via testing. And you might also argue that proving theorems is better than testing, right? Because testing, you have a representative set of cases, but you don't really prove it. If you prove the theorem, you've shown it for all, all cases. Okay, so the key thing that static typing will do is let you catch coding errors earlier in the process during compilation instead of having, and, and by the way, if you're sloppy and don't write tests, then you may not catch them until you deploy it. That's really bad. Okay, so uh, what was the reaction of schemers, uh, to, like myself, uh, at, this, at the time uh, ML, uh, the ML results came out? And uh, so a, a lot of schemers just defected. They said, oh, you know, this is what we'll do. We, we, we like the statically typed world. But there were hardcore people like Matthias Felleisen and myself, and we try and write uh, our code in ML, we get very frustrated. And uh, it's, it, it turns out that we just, it's wired in the way we think about problems to be able to have true, true union types, which means you have subtypes, right? You take the union of A and B as a type, then A is a subtype of it, and B is a subtype of it. And you have no true subtypes in the, the world that Milner, the extension of, in fact, anything based on the, the simply typed lambda calculus. So the moral here is if you can live with a, stat with a partition typing framework, then Milner's polymorphic extension is very attractive. Okay? And uh, if you can't, then you you're going to live in the, in the world of, of uh, at this stage, given the technology we have, of uh, dynamically typed languages. Um, and one thing I should point out, so some of you have heard of the language Haskell. Haskell is, a, is a, a, in the same family, so Haskell has the same property that I'm talking about in terms of uh, all values belonging to a single monotype. Okay? single basic type. Uh, they only belong to one. So at any rate, the political implications were that, that Milner's grand discovery, and I, I think it really was terrific work, uh, but it sort of split those of us who like functional programming into two camps, and we spent as, much, spent as much time fighting each other as trying to advocate functional programming, which is probably to the detriment of functional programming. Okay, so now let's talk about something that I worked on personally. So I, I was very impressed with Milner's type inference and said, well, you know, why can't we use that, those same techniques just to infer types for things that are written in dynamically typed languages? And I called this uh, soft typing. The idea is now you have a type checker that's an auxiliary tool. You write your program in Scheme, you can run it, but if you're kind of anal and want to make sure it's actually right, maybe I shouldn't 
I shouldn't refer to that negatively, it's a very good thing, then you can, you can put it through the soft typer and see to what extent you, the, the, the soft typer can conclude that no runtime checks, no runtime errors can occur. And uh, so the answer was, that, you know, this was the goal. I had a very sharp graduate student, Mike Fagan, who worked with me on this. And we were able to produce a system that, in fact, did a pretty good job of inferring types for dynamically typed programs. And it actually used a version of Milner's algorithm. But you have to use a different representation for types. You have to use something called row variables. And the representations are reasonably complex. You can sort of think of this, this compound record that has a field for each different type, kind of type construction that's going to describe whether those values can occur at the type. And uh, so another student of mine who came along later, Andrew Wright, actually built a, a system and applied to thousands and thousands of lines of scheme code and discovered that over 90% of the runtime checks that would be done naively by a scheme implementation were inferred as not being necessary by the soft typer. So the soft typer basically would show you every place that based on its typing, it couldn't confirm that a, that a runtime check that's done in the brute force system uh, was unnecessary. So between 5 and 10% of, of the checks would show up as, as things that our, our soft typer couldn't get. Uh, and so anyway, so from that side, it looks extremely successful. And this is one reason, for example, if you're doing code optimization. In Scheme, you run the system, and suddenly you, you've gotten rid of 95% of your runtime checks. Um, th this is for code written in a functional style. Now, you write imperatively you know, with lots of assignments and so on. You don't get anything like uh, that. You get, you get a lot more runtime checks. But the downside, there's a downside to this. We tried to use it in, in courses, and, and we couldn't get students to actually use the thing. There's an extra level of effort required to put things through the soft typer. And so Matthias Felleisen himself turned out to be by far the biggest user of the system. And uh, he was motivated by some of the things he experienced with it to, to develop a different soft typing system based on set-based analysis. And um, Matthias sold it as better. I'm not sure it really is. And I'd love to talk to people about it afterward. Uh, but, but the problem is, the nice thing about Milner's work is that, it, it, by the way, for a long time, people believed that Milner's type inference was linear in the size of the program. And then some very sharp people like Bob Harper and others said, well, let's prove it. John, John Missile, Bob Harper. And they found they couldn't prove the theorem. You know, when you can't prove a theorem you think is true, you sort of say, well, is the theorem really true? And you try and come up with a counterexample. And they were able to come up with counterexamples that required exponential time. So here we are. We have all these languages out there that use, the, use uh, Milner's inference system. And the worst case is exponential. Now, why hadn't, didn't anybody discover that until they tried to prove the theorem? And I found this truly remarkable. This is an example of an algorithm whose asymptotic complexity is horrible. It's, it's exponential, yet in practice, no one had ever found a situation where it didn't run in linear time. So that, take that to you know, those who take theory courses on algorithms. Remember, asymptotic complexity, it's a good guideline, but it's not perfect. Okay? I asked Hans Bohm, who had really terrific, had the best combination of insight into algorithms and real implementations of anybody I knew. I said, and he'd done some research actually on undecidability issues in, in type systems. I said, Hans, why doesn't ML show this exponential behavior on real code? He says, oh, that's easy. If you added all the type annotations, so now you no longer let them be inferred, you're declaring them all. So you're actually being very uh, you know, disciplined. You're going to write down all the types. For these programs that exhibit exponential behavior, they're exponentially larger. The annotations explode. He says, how many people are going to write programs where if they wrote down all the types, it would be exponentially bigger? So it's just like our intuition just does not go there. OK, okay so let's talk now about object-oriented programming, which I haven't mentioned at all, except I guess I mentioned Smalltalk was one possible uh, dynamically typed language. Well, um, let's see. Did I leave out a slide? I left out a slide. Okay, I had some things hidden, so I, but I can interpolate in, in it. So uh, it, it, w our curriculum at Rice uh, uh, embraced this idea of teaching that model of uh, recipe for developing code in, in schemas in our intro course. But then we felt, oh, you know, look out, how many people are going to be able to take sk skills in developing scheme code and go out in the industry and, and directly apply it? I mean, how many things do you know of that are written in scheme or, or a lisp-like dialect? There are a few, but not very many. Okay. So we felt the need, and it, C++ in the early 90s was clearly gaining a lot of traction. We thought it was going to be, or, or very quickly would be, the dominant language for doing applications programming, so we had to teach C++. Okay. Now, I personally hated C++. Now, if you, may, you may have already heard me say enough to know why I hated it. It's not remotely type safe. Right? I mean, it has a type checker, and it does all sorts of things, but it doesn't prove any theorems for you in the end. And um, 
I said, golly, we ought to have some alternative to C++ that actually is type safe. So Matthias and I started designing a variant of C++. We we're going to use conservative garbage collection, which is a whole separate lecture, but you can actually do fairly well garbage collecting C programs if you want. Um, we're going to use the conservative garbage collection instead of the regular malloc library, and then we're going to post some restrictions so you couldn't do certain things that would, that would break type safety. But this, we, this was you know, 94 or whatever, 94, 95. Then Java comes out. Matthias and I look at Java and say, here's a language that's, that's sort of coherent and self-contained that has all the same restrictions in it built in to get type safety that we were thinking about for C++. <coughs> so we said, let, let, let's just do Java. And so, we just, so I made an argument to the faculty that in our second semester course, CS2, we should teach Java instead of C++. In fact, Matthias used to call the old system where we would teach Scheme and then C++, he'd call it heaven and hell. You know, first semester's heaven, second semester's hell. And I said, right, let's make hell more palatable. Let's do it in Java. Um, so, but in order to teach Java, I had to learn it, right? So here I am, you know, you, you can, I, I, I can be very self-critical of sort of the, the armchair uh, academic, right? He knows all about programming, doesn't really write programs himself, right? And so I knew all about O-O programming. I categorized it as a niche technology, good for GUIs and maybe actor-based uh, concurrent computations. But I was totally unconvinced that it was natural for things he would do functionally. I mean, after all, why would you want to send the message plus five to three to add three to five? Right? I mean, it just struck me as bizarre. Right? It's just, it's just, this is a warped perspective. But to teach it, I had to learn OO. And so I started coding lots of scheme exercises in Java. And to my surprise, I thought about it just a little bit, it was easy. Uh, and so it turns out that the algebraic types that we like to, to use in functional programming, there's a direct representation for them in the OO world using so-called composite pattern. Has anybody taught design patterns at all? The composite pattern is just the natural way to encode algebraic types in OO. And um, so, so I started saying, wow, you know, I'm, I'm working in this language. And furthermore, it's statically typed. And I'm not even noticing the fact that it's not inhibiting my expressiveness, which I thought was truly remarkable. And so Dan Freeman was visiting Rice at the time. He knew a lot more about OO than I did. He actually tried writing a lot of OO code earlier. And he said, oh, Corky, you need to read the Gang of Four book. How many people know what I mean when I say Gang of Four? Is that a term used here? Uh, the, by the way, Ralph Johnson was my student for a while at Cornell before I left to go to Rice, and he didn't want to come with me, so he ended up doing uh, work with um, Fred Schneider, but he, he, which in, in security. Then he went back to uh, or, 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 or uh, you know, fault tolerant operating systems. Then he went back to programming language as soon as he got out, which which pleased me. Okay, so um, at any rate, so I started teaching uh, Java, and I found I could easily translate any scheme program as long as it didn't use Call CC. And for those of you who know, call CC is very esoteric. I don't like it. When I teach scheme, I don't teach it, OK? But it is very, it, it's very powerful. But so not many scheme programs, in my experience, particularly if you're trying to do mainstream application development, use call CC. So I could translate the corresponding thing to Java. And furthermore, I could actually get, a, in some ways, a cleaner design because I could use inheritance. There's no inheritance in the functional world. Okay, so how do you use inheritance? Well, it turns out you end up in the functional world, if you like, right, like you end up with functions that take an enormous number of parameters. And in the inheritance world, a lot of times you can replace passing those parameters by just inheriting the data object uh, from the superclass. So at uh, any rate, uh, I, I, I got hooked on Java. And then I also, at the same time, was really trying to do systematic uh, unit testing. And I found that Java was a lot better suited to unit testing than functional languages, which I'll explain why in a moment. Okay. So I was really hooked on OOP, and uh, now, in fact, you probably talked to some of my former functional programming colleagues, and they say, I, I'm a traitor to the cause. I, I went over to the dark side of OOP. So let's talk about types in, in, in OOP. So Java's statically typed, Scheme's dynamically typed. Yet I had no problem translating Scheme code to Java code. Why is that? In, in contrast, you know, I tried to write my Scheme examples, even in, in enhanced uh, Milner-style uh, lambda calculi, I, I, I just couldn't do it. I can actually show you some examples on the board afterward that, that I won't type. But I could, I, could, I could always express these things in Java. And then I, so I said, well, what's going on here? Well, it turns out Java types are predicates rather than partitions. Remember those two pictures? If there's a single takeaway from this talk, I want you to understand that the historic statically typed languages based on the, the lambda calculus, types are partitions. But in fact, it's much more convenient to have types be predicates that can overlap. And that's what you get in uh, Java. And it, Java's whole typing framework is called nominal, with inheritance being the basis for the type, ty typing. 
And it's still not very well understood by a lot of type theorists. You do research and they, they take them back. They say, inheritance is not subtyping, you guys got it all wrong. No, they don't understand the semantics of Java. They got it all wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll save that for a talk maybe we'll give later in the term. Okay, but at uh, any rate, so I do these translations. Occasionally I've got to put CAS in, right? But that's no big deal. If you think about what, what is Scheme doing every time it's doing a runtime check? It's doing the equivalent of a CAS. You just don't write them down. Right, so it is wordier, but I wasn't terribly offended by the need to, to insert cast. There was only one context where writing cast just became so overwhelmingly burdensome that I didn't like it. I say, no, oh, this is corrupty. This is not good. And that's when you do what's called parametric polymorphism in Java. That, that append example I gave you, when you write that in Java, right, you've got to use lists of objects. This is Java 1.4, not, not, not 5.0. Not, not this is before Java 5 came out. And you end up doing all these casts, right? Because every time you have a list of mumble, you, it's, it's list of object as far as your list class is concerned. And when you pull an object out, you've got to cast it to a mumble. Okay, so, um, but in general in Java, if you run into a type issue, basically there's a workaround. You just loosen the types and use cast. Right? It's sort of a rule of thumb, but I, have, I, I, I can think of no case in where I had a type issue where I couldn't, couldn't get around it that way. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, types in OOP. Let me look at my time. I'm almost, I mean, I've got to go quickly here. Um, so at any rate, it turns out that Java was missing this ability to, plat to, to parameterize class definitions by type and methods by type. This looked an awful lot like the extension that Milner added to, this, to the uh, untyped lambda calculus. So I was really interested in this idea of adding uh, type parameterization to Java. So in 97, 98, I went on a sabbatical to Sun Microsystems Lab in Boston in a group with Guy Steele. I said, oh, you know, I can really look at the, you know, this issue. Oh, well, meanwhile, Mark Andrewski and Phil Wadler were, were working on the same problem, and they had already developed it. Well, they were in the process of developing an extension to Java called GJ, and Mark Andrewski is a great developer. You know, I guess you know, this is pre-Scala, right? He's the father of Scala. And uh, so he developed a variant. In fact, he, he'd written his own compiler. I say a variant. He'd written his own compiler for Java that subsequently became Java C. Sun bought the rights to his compiler before they even did anything with generics. Java 1.3, Java C is Odersky's compiler. Java C prior to 1.3 was their own, which was, I, I never looked at the source code. I'm very familiar with the source code of Odersky stuff. It was pretty well written. I heard the source code for, for Scheme's original, I mean, for, for Sun's original product. Uh, was, was not very uh, intelligible. Okay, so, but the difference between the design that Odersky and Wadler were looking at and the one that Guy and I developed was that Odersky and Wadler use erasure. So those of you who've used Java generics, you probably run into the whole issue of erasure. But the idea is that, and in fact, this was going on in ML implementations. Once you figure out things are, are, are type correct, you don't actually have to tag your list with the kind of the type that it is. It's, it's, it's just, it just, in fact, in, in, it, since things are disjoint, in ML, you don't even tag it as a list. You just know it's a list statically. But in, because uh, Java has the ability to check types at runtime, you have tags on things, but the actual runtime object only says list. It doesn't say list of integer, uh, list of uh, Boolean, even though you parameterize it as list of T. Guy and I wanted a design with first class types so that list of integer was a real type that was available as a dynamic type at runtime. And uh, we worked pretty hard to get everything to work, okay, to get the design to work. I was pretty proud of, of that work, uh, but Guy and I lost the political battle. Okay? So the, the powers that be at um, Sun decided that it would be erasure, and that's what we have today. And I think Scala suffers from that, but that's a, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, discussion on its own. Okay, so... Uh, let's take a look at the state of the art in OO programming, and I'll, since I'm running out of time, I'll, I'll, I'll give an overview of the slide rather than going through each of the point slides. This is the same design recipe I showed you in the context of Scheme. Just slightly tweaked. You know, the same, the same conceptual step is used in, in both cases. So you've got to understand the problem, and you've got to define the data domains. Well, that means laying out all the classes, what they look like. Right? It's, I think this is called data modeling, right, in, in, in the OO world. Then you've got to state a contract for each method that you have in a class. And then you've got to give, for each method, you need to give examples, right? So how, how is it going to behave? And you actually would like to assemble these examples in a, in a, in a, in a, little, a little class, a JUnit test, right? And uh, so now, we, so if you're following this recipe, you're writing the, you're writing the test class before you've even written the, the class that is testing. Uh, and then uh, you want to use, it turns out good OO design 
already dictates most of the information that we had in our templates for the, the functional world. And I, I'll be glad to show you that on, on the board. But there are a few cases where you have to think a little bit, OK, exactly what's the gross structure of this method B? And uh, in, in, in that case, you, you, you do write a little template code. Then you fill in the templates, fill in the slots, writing the actual code, and then you, 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 you test using these, these unit tests. Okay? And confirm the tests succeed. And again, so you know, testing is just woven all the way, way through this. OK, so now why is Java better suited to unit testing than ML and Scheme? Well, this is the impact that writing in Java has on code. When you write something in Java, you have everything at the terms of classes that are top-level things. Now, occasionally you use a true inner class, but how many of you t use true inner classes a lot? I'll use static inner classes because I want to put a whole bunch of classes in the same file. But that's not the same thing. I'm talking about an inner class where when you create the inner class instance, you have a, have a parent instance that you can refer to from the inner class. Okay? And uh, it's, rare, it's comparatively rare. So it turns out that if you want to test anything in your classes, it's all at top level. It's all exposed. It's, a, it's available for testing. In Scheme and ML, there is a preferred style. And that is you push functions as deeply down in the lexical structure as you can. So if something's pushed down to the level where the things that consume, that need it are. You don't want it to be any more global than that. The idea is you don't want to pollute the namespace. You want to keep things hidden. Okay? Which makes sort of s sense from the standpoint of the interface that you see. But it's horrible for testing. Because you can't get to the thing. You can't, if, some, if, you, if you have, a, a, think about it, a lexical level inside, you can't even talk about calling those functions because they're not in scope. Okay? And my experience when I was doing this, when we were teaching that, the, the, the scheme course, is occasionally I would end up having a test version of the program that had the method at global, and then I'd have, okay, and then we finally push it inside to, to conform with good style. So the program I tested was not actually the program that, that I delivered, that I deployed. And so uh, one other thing I want to mention that is different about my perspective on unit testing from what I see in most of the literature. You want to unit test every single unit in your program, which means the whole program itself, because you build units out of smaller units. Okay? The program itself is a, is a big unit. And so in your unit testing suite, you ought to have things that are testing the functionality of the whole program. Now, I've actually talked to Adam a little bit about this. And he's worked at this in an industrial context, and I have not. We actually use this in Dr. Java and Dr. Scala. That's the only testing we have is unit testing. But we have things that test the whole, the, the, the whole shebang. Um, now, it may be the case that you have a very extensive battery of tests that you want to run at the acceptance level, at the top level. And it's not feasible to run those as part of your normal commit process. And then I can see a reason for, a sort of pragmatic reason for separation. But in principle, unit testing spans the granularity, the entire granularity of the program, down from the smallest unit that makes sense semantically all the way to the whole program. OK, so state of the future in OO programming. So I'm guessing here, right, and extrapolate what's going on. What, but what I want to point out is there's this complementary effect between what you can do with static checking and what you can do with testing. And I would like to see a language design that sort of sees it as a continuum where you, and, and a real emphasis on trying to write executable contracts that are, you know, just, just they're predicates. They're pure predicates, Boolean functions of the input and the output. And uh, if in fact, a method contract really consists of two parts. You've got to have a characterization of the intended input. That's a predicate. You've got to have an input-output predicate that says what outputs are possible for each input. You'd like to express these predicates as much as possible using types. Even if you're in a dynamically typed context, which you know, now that I'm on the dark side of Java, I, I find the nominal type system not a burden. But you'd like to express it in terms of types, and maybe the predicate's going to be a conjunction of, of, of various statements that you can view as types, plus some extra stuff that doesn't quite fit the types. And then you want to check those contracts as, as much as possible using a something like a soft type or a static analysis system to see if you can prove them. And then for the ones you can't prove, then you need to do testing. And an idea that I've been pushing for a long time, and I'm not sure it'll work, but it's certainly worth looking at very hard. And that is, can you use the predicate that characterizes the valid inputs for a method as an implicit generator of test data? And the idea that I have in mind is, anybody have any experience here in Prolog? If you look at prolog evaluation, right, it's really doing pattern matching, filling in values for unknowns. And I would like to try and look at the predicate definition for the input, very much like a prolog goal, and see if I can't come up, generate lots of instances that, that satisfy it. Now, I first proposed this idea in a paper I wrote in 1981, and it hasn't happened since. So, you know, maybe the actual reality of it is um, 
difficult. I keep looking for a student that I can really, that's really clever about this sort of thing. I haven't found one yet, unfortunately. Okay. So at any rate, but you can always fall back on some of the things that are done in property-based testing, right, where you manually write the generator, okay, instead of just trying to evaluate the, the input predicate. The other thing that you can do, of course, is sometimes even manual generators don't really work, and then they, they, there's, a, there's a fallback position in property-based testing where you just have a table that has, that out for sort of like unit testing, right, except you still like to have the, out, the, the correctness condition written as an executable specification as opposed to saying, oh, the answer is this. Right, because you can sort of load your, one, one way to cheat unit testing is just run a bunch of examples, see what the answers are, and make a unit test, test, t test that you do what your program did before. Okay, so uh, I had one thing, I, I didn't know where to put this, so I had pictures, and you know, there's, there's intellectual property issues. Every, all of my pictures I pulled from uh, the Wikimedia Commons, right, so which has uh, free access. So thanks all for your time, and I'll be glad to answer questions. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so you described these two worlds of, of uh, type systems which are based on partitions and those are, that are based on unions. And in my experience, the ones that are based on partitions have this really nice type inference. Absolutely. Which makes terse programs. So Absolutely. Are, is there any chance to see that for the, the other? You know, like maybe somebody smarter than I am can figure out how to do it. It looks, it looks really difficult to do. because. Take a look at what's going on in Hindley Muller type inference, right? You have these primitives which are uniquely named, right? So you see a primitive that somebody using say, oh, I know that that's working on this kind of data and it's going to produce this kind of result because it's a primitive on that. It's, it's built in the data type definitions that you've given. In the world of Java, where you have classes and, every, and so on, generally those names aren't unique. You don't have the same markers to work on and in inferring. And that's, so those of you who've used Scala, it does some local type inference. It's very heuristic, right? Because it's a very, very hard problem. I would hope we can do better than Scala does. Okay? But I think that's an ongoing uh, research issue and, and, and one that's difficult and, and, and technical, but I, I think that the progress is likely, but I don't think you're going to get to, to, to what you have with, with Henley Milner. And that's, that means that there's probably going to be a bit of this division going forward for as far as I can see. And I'm not one to say that, that the Henley Milner approach is wrong. You know, it's just, I, I just get very frustrated because there are certain things I just can't write. And it's not my style in terms of the way I think about writing programs to sort of conform to the, 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 the uh, type constraints that, that exist there with all the types are, are, are disjoint. Maybe if I'd grown up in that culture, I'd feel differently. I don't know. So I think, it's, I think it's, that's an open question as to which side of, uh, of the mark. Uh, let's see, I, will, I will throw in one thing that made me, you know, I kind of like to believe I'm right, right? But that is that the, the, the Henley Miller discipline is not very friendly to OO. If you look at OCaml, they added object orientation as best they could in OCaml. And in fact, to do soft typing, we use some of the, Didier Ramey is a very smart guy. He designed a lot of that stuff. We use some of his encode, type encoding ideas to try and fit object oriented programming into ML to do soft typing. Okay? So, but, but if you take a look, every old Campbell program I've talked to says, I don't use the OO stuff. My impression is it's so brittle and so hard to use that people just ignore it. And based on the anomalies that I've seen with a soft typer, I believe it. Now, it's tolerable in an auxiliary tool, a static analysis tool, to have it occasionally do something flaky. But if it's part of the language definition in order to get your program to run, it better be simple and something that you can control. And my impression is that if you try and use the OO features in OCaml, you really get messed up. So if you're really tied to OO and like to think in that way, I don't think if we're going to end up with a, with a Henley Milner style inference framework. But on the other hand, you look at the Haskell people and the, and the ML people, and they certainly do impressive things. So. Other questions? Yes, No, not so much. Now, there, okay, good, 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 thank you, thank you, Wally, because, uh, so the question was, um, given, I, I say that scheme is not as friendly to unit testing as, as Java, because you have these deeply nested definitions, and the question was, do you see the same phenomenon in C? And I would say, uh, ironically not, because C doesn't have nested procedures, right? It doesn't have much lexical nesting. Basically, all the functions you write in C are at the top level. So you have the same ease of access in writing tests. Now, I will say I do see one significant disadvantage to uh, trying to use unit testing in the context of C and C++ versus uh, Java, and that is that type safety, 
is guaranteeing that all sorts of errors can't occur. So when we're, when we're unit testing Java, there are already a whole collection of properties that have been established for us. When we do it with C, we have this problem that we could actually test that a particular unit has some functionality, but not notice as clobbering something else. Because you, know, you can forge addresses, so you can have some little routine that looks like it's doing some simple uh, local thing that you test. And in fact, it's forging an address and clobbering a bunch of memory, and your test wouldn't, wouldn't detect that. That can't happen in Java because you can't get a hold of those arbitrary areas of memory. Do you have another question? Yes. I know, I'm only superficially familiar with Eiffel. I would say my knowledge of Eiffel is on a par with what my knowledge of OO was before I, I, I went over to the dark side. In fact, I, 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 can, I can parrot my critiques that I used to give of OO, and then I can give the others, and I can now shoot, shoot them down. Uh, my impression of Eiffel is that, um, let's see, I guess Eiffel has multiple inheritance, doesn't it? I'm trying to remember, which I, uh, actually, uh, the compromise in uh, Scala, I think, is exactly the right one. Multiple inheritance gives you problems as soon as you can inherit fields. If you don't inherit fields, multiple inheritance is fine. So, you, so in contrast, Java went too far with interfaces, where you have multiple interface inheritance, but you can't inherit any code that through the multiple inheritance facility. Scala lets you inherit code, but not fields. And that's exactly the right compromise. Yes, in, in, in Eiffel. So, 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 so I, I, I think that that's, I, I'm very supportive of, of what, so the question is, is, is Eiffel sort of a language that's moving in the direction that I have in mind? And my superficial impression is yes. Uh, my own experience, so, so I have to, you know, I talk about things in the abstract and theoretical. My own experience in writing real code in Dr. Java is that there are lots of grubby things you write where you say, golly, writing the contract is going to be at least as bad as writing the code. And if, in the, those cases, I think it's a pretty hard battle. Maybe in industry, you can mandate it, and you get an extra level of reliability from it, because basically what you're doing is you're writing the same grubby stuff twice, which you're writing in a very different way in the specification, and proving that they're, that they're compatible, that they're consistent is, 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 is useful. Uh, on the other hand, you look at how much payoff you get for an awful lot of investment, and you might question, is that the best place to invest those resources in terms of improving the reliability of the system? And I don't know the answer to that question. On that note, uh, I, uh, you know, I want to say that there is some cake that's sitting outside that uh, will provide us with more opportunity for uh, questions and discussions and so on. We have a nice little tradition that also Roland makes sure I remember here, which is this uh, small present oh, from the thank university. You. Thank so you. thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you.